I guess only spoke about matrix product states. So I want to very briefly um, discuss Pep Samara just sort of for completeness and because it explains some interesting aspects. Um, so I've pre-written these things uh, slightly on, on my handwritten notes, but of course you get you know the, the full notes uh, on, on the web page as soon as this is over. So don't have to worry about copying these pictures, uh, but you can see they're a little bit uh, tedious to draw. So one natural question one might ask is uh, how does this entire uh, story of matrix product states generalized, right? So the motivational state, well, they are states that satisfy an area law by construction, but then there were these you know, very nice results that uh, whenever there's, there is an area law in a pseudo sense, and actually you can approximate your state well by this family of states. And you could, it's very natural to ask, you know, what's the story in higher dimensions, or maybe for some more general interaction graph that maybe doesn't really have a dimension associated with it. And so I think I briefly mentioned yesterday that there's this uh, ansatz called PEPs, project entangled pair states. Uh, and that's really just the same thing we have been doing, but for a general graph. So here I showed it for square 2D lattice. And um, the idea is, right, you have some, uh, say interaction graph to some graph. And then um, so the edges of the graph, they are the virtual bonds. And then at each vertex, you also have a dangling leg that corresponds to the physical index. Right? So this picture, this uh, two-dimensional tensor network is going to define a quantum state on a lattice um, uh, where the local dimensions are little d. And the virtual bond dimensions here, for example, I take all to be equal to capital D. And um, so just, you know, as for matrix product states, it's not so hard to see that these states uh, have to satisfy an area law, right? That, and now it's sort of an interesting area law where the entropy actually scales, but it doesn't scale with the volume. It still scales with the boundary, but the boundary is non-trivial now. It's not just two points or one point, right? So I guess uh, pictorially, um, suppose the subsystem I care about would be, uh, so the subsystem A might be as, uh, I don't know, let's say those, Next here, right, then, um, well, what's the boundary? Uh, the boundary, of course, are sort of these edges, right, that sort of go out. So, and indeed, we can easily, using the same strategy as we discussed yesterday, we can derive and bound on the entropy, even on the max entropy, which is just, you know, the number of bonds we have to cut. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? These are these virtual bonds that we have to cut in order to separate uh, these blue legs these blue dangling legs from, I guess, well, the other ones that are also blue, but they're not, they're not shaded blue, which is the highlighted blue from all the other dangling ones, right? So I guess what I uh, denoted in blue here was subsystem A. And well, I guess it's nicer to draw sort of a curve that crosses all of these bonds, that makes the counting maybe nicer. And so this is, the, and so the number of bonds that I cross by this curve, that's uh, the boundary of A, and right, each one contributes a log dimension log D. So that's very natural generalization, makes sense in higher dimensions and so on. And so on. Uh, sadly, somehow there are some things that become more complicated here. For example, it is not uh, known whether uh, any ground state of a gap local 2D Hamiltonian actually does admit an matrix pro uh, a PEPs approximation, an approximation by a for form of the state, and you know, in the sense where the bond dimension it does not is not too large, say polynomial in the system size. That's what one would like. Um, there are interesting counterexamples, but there is a uh, uh, contrived area law states that um, are neither ground states of gap local Hamiltonians nor admit in perhaps approximation. Some of the area law in some sense is not good enough. Um, uh, so I can give them some reference for this. So that so that's quite some theory that's not yet uh, so, so well understood, but I think this could still be a true statement. Uh, another complication is that we saw that for matrix product states, the fact that things were on a line, right? And we can sweep from left to right through our line that allowed us to compute uh, expectation values, correlation functions, and so on very efficiently. Now in this 2D situation, it's no longer clear what to do. You can, like if you say sweep, you know, uh, from the left to the right, then it's kind of like you sort of have a super tensor sitting here, but this one has a large one dimension now. It's kind of like, of course, you could take this 2D grid and you could sort of squish it to, together, you know, to a, to, a, to a matrix product state where sort of all these bonds are being collapsed, but that would not be efficient. So in general, actually uh, computing even the norm of a of a of a parent tangent product state uh, can be a, 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 well is a computation hard problem. Uh, actually, even deciding whether you know you give me a, a bunch of tensors and you ask me is the corresponding state well, is, does this have norm zero or non zero? That's already an NP hard problem in general. Of course, that doesn't you know stop people from doing numerics and, and things actually working out in practice, but that's kind of a subtlety. So maybe one cannot hope for, for such strong results. 
Um, another interesting feature is that, whereas maybe um, some of you thought about the homework, you know, deriving some interesting conditions such uh, you know, that ensure that correlations decay uh, in a translation variant MPS. Here, one can build translation variant PEPs where correlations well don't decay exponentially, but say rather only algebraically. Maybe that's also a nice thing to think about. I mean, about these little questions I asked, maybe we can discuss them after after the lecture or, or, on, or on Slack. Okay, so so there's lots I should be saying here. You could also ask you know, how hard is it um, to, uh, can we, could we in theory build a device that takes input, a, des a description of a PEPs and it creates the quantum state as the output, right? And then maybe continue manipulating by using a quantum computer, not a classical one. Uh, turns out that's actually also a tricky problem. And that's really the, 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 the thing that makes uh, uh, PEPs say harder than a quantum circuit, which is also a two dimensional beast is this lack of unitarity that I mentioned last time. So on the flip side, people have actually, you know, proposed variants of PEPs where there's some unitary feature inside the tensors that then allows, you know, um, uh, sort of computation to proceed more efficiently. So these are, you know, just a few examples of, of things that people are actively thinking about. And I'm very happy to provide references. I, I mean, I have not worked on the numerical aspect, but I, I think I can find some interesting reference for you. So that's one sort of generalization, and maybe that's all I want to say about PEPS. Um, now, PEPS is a two-dimensional ansatz for a, a two-dimensional quantum system. MPS is a one-dimensional ansatz for a one-dimensional quantum system. Uh, both sort of the, you know, the intuition or the, well, the, the we would be particularly interested in using those for gapped uh, uh, states, the gap ground states. Um, uh, but how about critical systems, say, in one dimension? So that's the next thing I want to discuss. And again, I prepared a little bit here. Um, so there are sort of two answers you could give. If you're sort of pragmatic and you just want to compute, right? In some sense, you can still use matrix product states. Now there's a bit more entanglement, right? Log, log of the system size rather than constant, but that's okay. That's not too bad. It still gets a polynomial scaling in the end, okay? But somehow uh, you could be maybe unsatisfied because somehow, um, you know, these bonds, in your matrix product states, they now no longer only contain the local entanglement, right? Because somehow in a critical system, there should be entanglement at all scales. And somehow that's not reflected by this ansatz. Uh, so there is a question, the question one could ask, is there a more conceptual approach? That's, you know, maybe that's, it's not more economic, not more efficient from a numerical point of view, uh, but perhaps it reflects more of the physics of the system. And uh, such an approach has been proposed by, by Gifford Vidal. It's called MERA, the last acronym, I think, for the series lectures, uh, short for multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. And the idea is basically, this is a network structure that is meant to describe a, uh, a one-dimensional quantum state that has entanglement at all scales. And um, so it's in particularly meant um, to describe, uh, well, scale invariant or you know, critical theories. And uh, the, the ansatz itself also looks that way. So it consists of self-similar layers. And the idea is, uh, there's various ways of interpreting this, but the idea is you can think of each layer as basically uh, either, well, if you, uh, in, if you read it in one direction as adding detail, so sort of fine-graining your system, or if you read it in the other way around as coarse-graining your system. So it's some kind of renormalization, uh, read space renormalization intuition behind this ansatz, hence the name. Okay. So I'll show you the picture now, what it looks like, and it's a bit, maybe a bit, uh, uh, actually maybe I'll first show you one layer. Um, so that's, uh, okay, that looks uh, strange. Let me just uh, close the shade here. Okay. So what is, uh, what is this thing that we're seeing here? So this is a particular tensor network. It's, we don't worry about the boundaries. It continues infinitely to the left, to the right, or maybe it's on a, on a circle. Um, the one interesting feature is that at the bottom, uh, there's twice as many dangling legs than at the top. Right. So that's a transformation from n qubits to twice as many qubits. Okay. Now this transformation has a certain form. Okay. There's these boxes and the boxes they have of you know, two incoming legs and two outgoing legs. Um, and there's the triangles and they have one input and two outputs. So two inputs, one output, depending on whether you read from top to bottom or the other way around. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that this network will consist of many layers like, like so. And we just stack them on top of each other. And so what happens is that we are um, uh, well, again, there's two interpretations. We imagine that sort of the state of interest actually is to be created here. So the idea is that we are going to create this, the state scale by scale. So we're first creating a very coarse grained version, then we're adding detail, adding detail, detail. Yeah, so we're fine graining all the way. And at each step kind of because, you know, 
Uh, this is not some of our tensor product, but there's some interactions we can locally create entanglement. And as we zo zoom in, this local entanglement becomes less local and so on and so forth. So I'll just show you, and we'll talk about, you know, what, what are what is the content of these triangles as unitaries in a moment. But for, for now, it's just a structure that I want to discuss. This is just some like vaguely translation variant structure uh, and the key features, right? There's some unit, well, there's some uh, object, you know, that sort of correlates neighbors and then sort of sort of um, translated by one lattice side, there's a thing that removes degrees of freedom or that adds degrees of freedom if you think of it as a map from top to bottom. Okay, so let me show you the, the whole or uh, part of the, the entire ansatz. So that should be here. Okay, so that, uh, that's, you can see why I didn't want to draw this in real time. So the bottom two um, uh, layers, I guess they form one uh, sort of macro layer, the same one I showed you before, and that thing is going is, is repeated all the time, right? So this uh, layer here, right? That's just one out of many copies, and the the ones at the top they look kind of wider, right? And that's because the system was coarse grained, so we have to stretch the circuit, but it's the same content, okay? And we just we just keep going, right? So we um, so the network proceeds like it becomes sort of coarse and coarser as we go up. Okay, so that's one interpretation. So we can think of this direction as coarse graining. Um, but really what, we, what, what we're interested in is we wanna build a state, we wanna construct a state and the state that we wanna build sits actually at the bottom, right? So these should be the dangling legs, the only dangling legs at the end of the sunsets. So what we are going to do is say, if we have a finite system, we would coarse grain, coarse, coarse, coarse grain until maybe there's only one input at the top and there we just put in some arbitrary state, right? So, or maybe we cut off after some layers and we just put in a zero state here or something like this. Um, for now, I don't really want to commit to anything in particular that's not going to be so important because anyways, that's only going to create sort of super long range uh, uh, things. Okay. So the other direction, the, the direction downwards, that's the one way basically, uh, you know, add detail where we sort of zoom in or uh, we could, you could also say you add, we add entanglement. Okay. Um, Right, and because some of these are local elements here, so but they will locally add entanglement. So maybe between these two sides, right? Maybe this object is going to entangle these two sides. But then we are sort of zooming in, right? So what was neighboring sites beforehand is now actually a long, right? Has it's like a longer wavelength thing. It's sort of spread out more over the system. So the further up uh, you correlate or entangle, uh, sort of the more the less localized the corresponding mode will be at the bottom. That's sort of the physics intuition, maybe. But from a structural point of view, what I showed you here is the ansatz. There are some conditions that I'll talk about in a moment, but sort of let's just maybe talk about this picture for now. Okay, so the idea is there are self-similar layers, and each of these layers, right, it's sort of adding, it's doubling the degree, number of degrees of freedom, but by a local structure. Okay. And right, and really what such a layer is, so such a layer, it's really an operator, right? An operator written as a tensor network, so it's a tensor network operator. Um, right, it's sort of, I mean, maybe very vaguely similarly to this uh, uh, thermal state that I showed yesterday, but that was a very regular structure where it looked like a lattice and here that's not regular. It's still self-similar, but it's, it's more like this, uh, yeah, uh, coarse grainy structure. Okay. So maybe the first question we want to ask, how about the entanglement? What kind of bound can we prove on, uh, on the entanglement in such an ansatz, like without knowing anything about the tensors, right? Just from uh, the same reasoning we had, you know, for MPS and for PEPs. Uh, so how can we bound? the entanglement entropy. Does anyone have an idea? So maybe for concreteness, we're going to pick some specific subsystem A. Maybe I'll pick a nice one, maybe like so. Um, maybe I'll, yeah, that's okay. So that's subsystem A, right? And then the complement is this one. And again, you should imagine, right, this structure continuing layer, we're adding more and more and more layers um, until we don't, well, up to some point, but that, that will not be important anymore for the, that, that's not important for this question, kind of when and, and yeah, how we stop. But you should imagine everything at the end will be closed up here. The only dangling legs are the ones at the bottom. So this picture is going to define a pure state on this one dimensional line. Any thoughts about the entanglement? How would I, how could I get a really good bound on the max entropy 
uh, of this of the state. And what's, what was our procedure? We have some tensor network, you know, some arbitrary shape. There's the dangling legs corresponding to subsystem A. There's the other dangling legs corresponding to A complement. How do I get a bound on entropy? Can we look at the legs that are connected to the uh, to the triangle at the top, right? Or do we need to look only at the pure state legs at the bottom? Um, yeah, good question. So, so imagine um, imagine these are not dangling legs here, but the, the structure just continues. There's more and more layers, mm -hmm. more and more of these self similar layers, and maybe at some point, you know, we just feed in a product state or something like this. Sure. No, so, no I so, meant um, yeah, yeah. I meant like the uh, at the base we start with some state, and then above it mm -hmm. we connect that first layer um, with the with so right there exactly. So yeah. I was wondering if, if it's in those mm. legs. That if, if that's a good, that's a leg set of that connects uh, the left and the right kind of, right? right exactly. that, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, very good, exactly. Uh, so, so, so that's exactly what we are going to do. We are going to sort of try to sort of cut, cut through this network in such a way that we disconnect the A part from the A complement part, right? Because any such way of cutting gives us, again, a matrix factorization that bounds the ranks and hence the max entropy. So in this case, I mean, right, that's a, it's a discrete structure. So of course it won't look as beautiful. But basically what you have to, what you want to do is right, you want to sort of, you know, go upwards to some point and then go down again, right? Something like, uh, well, sorry, not this one, but rather that one. Whoop, that was uh, not what I wanted to do. Uh, let's say, let's say something like this. So somehow I would uh, maybe cut like so. Okay, that would be an okay thing to do. Okay. And, um, um, yeah, well, I mean, you could be a bit concerned what's going on here, but that concern will go away in a moment when I tell you a little bit more about the tensors. So maybe actually, let me let me just fix the picture to avoid this discussion for one. Um, let me just make this a little bit wider so that we will not have to talk about this uh, right now. Let me just make it like so to make it a bit nicer. Okay, so right, so so there's some value in sort of going up because then I have to cut less, uh, cut, I have to cut fewer legs, right? If I do so. And right, because some of the number of degrees freedom halves whenever I go up, generically I have to go lock system size many layers up. And whenever I go up, right, I'm going to cut a bond on the left and on the right. So there's a bound on the entropy that scales basically like the logarithm of the system size times the logarithm of this bond dimension as always. Right? Whenever I cut a bond, it costs me entropy or it can cost entropy up to a log D. So we'll find up to some constant uh, that, the, that the entropy can be bounded uh, by, sorry, log of the system size uh, or of the subsystem size. Okay, so it's exactly this logarithmically divergent uh, divergence or violation of, of an area law in 1D. So exactly what you might expect for a critical system in one dimension. Okay, so that's the, uh, so that's that's sort of built into this ansatz. Okay, and of course I, I added these wiggly lines. It's, it's not really a tight inequality because there's some discreteness here, right? So it's not, maybe there's, maybe you should multiply the whole thing by a factor of, two or something, okay? So um, so the C is, you know, maybe it's, you know, on large scales, it's basically like log D, but maybe we should just, yeah, maybe we add a factor of two just to be on the safe side or something like this. Or I guess we should add a factor of two because for each layer, there's the one bond on the left and one bond on the right, but also on top because of this kind of discreteness, okay? Um, right, so that's cool, right? So we, we have an answer that's sort of naturally, um, well, I guess it, the way I, we, I motivated it was, I, I want the self-similarity that we might expect from, from a critical uh, system. Um, I want it to be reflected in the ansatz and then the self-similarity um, um, or this, yeah, this coarse graining uh, feature as I go up, I uh, gives me this uh, logarithmic bound on entropy. Okay. And again, in general, that's just a bound, right? You could also take a gap state and you could try to you know, ca characterize it in this way. And then you know, it, maybe it wouldn't have as much entropy as it could have, but that's the amount of entropy this ansatz supports in principle. And that seems more, uh, that seems nice, okay. So one can play this game a bit further, right? One could sort of, um, um, I mean, that's what, what Giffrey Vidal did. So he said, okay, let's not just take any old tensors here, not just any arbitrary tensors, because actually that this is a 2D network. So everything about 2D ne networks generically is difficult, as I mentioned before. So it may, that would not be a useful computational ansatz. But what he pointed out is that if one demands some more structure of these objects, then actually this is an efficient ansatz. So, and what he demanded is actually a, a unitarity in some sense. So what he demanded is that all of these these um, um, uh, these uh, 
uh, boxes, these rectangles, that they are unitary from top to bottom or bottom to top, that's mathematics equivalent. And that all these triangles are isometries from here to there. Okay. So I think I, I also added this here. Oh, sorry, I guess that's what we just discussed. Um, so maybe I'll copy this guy over and we'll talk about what's below it in a moment. So his, he, he said, okay, let's, let's pick those tensors to be unitary. So let's pick those isometries. Okay. So one effect of this, for example, is that this quantum state will be automatically normalized, right? Because we never, norm never drops. Norm is always preserved as we start, if we start from the top and we go downwards, okay? But there's another effect that unitarity buys us. And that's that somehow there's now a sort of a ca causal cone in this network. And that means that a degree of freedom that's localized at the bottom, um, actually, uh, if you ask, you know, what, what, so if you want to compare say two layers of this network, say the state at this point, and the state at that point over here. You could ask, you know, what are the de degrees of freedom at, on this level that determine, say, these, th these three sites at the bottom? And uh, for a general tensor network, that could be every everywhere. There's no like causality because the tensors are not unitary. But if you demand that these, these guys are unitary and those are isometries, then you can basically just backtrack. Uh, you can just go up level by level. So you can, so, so, so maybe I zoom in a little bit. So suppose we are, um, Suppose we are interested in, in this part of the state, right? And, and, uh, um, and I wanna know, um, so I wanna compare the following two states, a state uh, at sort of this level, right? So I've prepared the state up until here. And then I have the state at the very uh, lowest level. That's when, when I have most detail. And I could ask, you know, what are the degrees of freedom um, uh, of the state at this level that, uh, uh, that can impact um, uh, the state here, okay? And then basically by unitarity, uh, these three legs, they can only imp be impacted by those, and also this one. Um, but then this one uh, can only come from here, this one can only come from here, this one, and so on and so forth. Right, and so I guess it's sort of a bit annoying to see, but in the end, what you get is you get kind of a causal cone here. Okay. So you see that kind of um, information in some sense cannot uh, spread arbitrarily. So if I'm interested in a local state, uh, then only a local part of this of the coarse grain state will contribute. Okay, sorry, let's uh, do some shading. Okay, so again, if I if I compare, say, state at this level and state at that level here, then if I uh, interested in say a reduced state of say you know a few sites here, then this will only depend on the reduced state of a few sites there. And similarly. If I have a local operator that acts, say, on the ladders at you know the finest scale, then I can coarse grain this local operator just by sandwiching with one layer of the network. And because of this unitarity and isometric nature of the tensors, this will also coarse grain to a local operator. Okay. And just to be very sure, right? I mean, this it seems like this cone spreads out, right? Like it, it seems like it becomes larger as we go up, but we actually don't because there's the, the, there's fewer tensors. The density of tensors decreases in the same at the same rate. So if you count, right, you see that there's uh, three degrees of freedom here, uh, three sides, and there's also oops, and there's also three sides at the top, right? And kind of throughout, maybe there's four at some point, um, but so throughout there's three. So there's a mapping, right? So if reduced state of three sites and one layer determines reduced state of three sites below and vice versa. So that's kind of interesting, okay? And one can sort of use this actually uh, to define a mapping, right? Really that say maps, you know, three local operators, one step up. And you can think of this as that's called the scaling super operator. Um, and you can, you know, think you can try to correlate this with say the, the data that it, you know, defines your critical theory. So by diagonalizing this operator, right? So for example, right, you, you, you would expect that if you have some operator and you, uh, you, know, you, you scale it, right? Well, it it's also will pick up a, a, an amplitude that, that depends on the, on the scaling dimension of your, of your, of your fields, let's say in a, in a CFT. Now here you can sort of see discrete versions of this. So you can build, an, uh, you can build a mapping that basically maybe I have a, I have a picture prepared. I guess that's the, that's the picture here. Very good. So maybe we can uh, talk about this together, and that's going to be the last uh, bit of my Mara sketch, I think. Um, so what you can do is, um, so that's basically exactly what, uh, describing this process. So imagine you have a local operator sitting here, and now I, apl I apply one layer of my network to the uh, cat of the operator, and you know the dagger to the bra of the operator. And then you know, in principle, this would be an infinitely wide strip. 
But if you think about it, there will be say a rectangle here and it's stack at the bottom. So because of unitarity, those will cancel. Everything outside of this causal cone will cancel. And the causal cone has constant width, three sides. And that allows you to basically see that a, a coarse graining of an operator O is just given by this you know, finite bounded tensor network here. Right? That's exactly kind of you know, the local part here that's up here and that's the dagger of it. So this is a map that sends operators to operators. So that's in quantum information, we call this a super operator. Maybe that's language Patrick used, channels, quantum channels are examples of this. So that's a super operator that you know, in the Heisenberg picture maps operators to operators. And it's kind of at the coarse graining operation that comes naturally. So whenever you have a mirror, it comes with such a coarse graining operation. And for example, you could try to diagonalize this operator, right? Diagonalizing this operator would mean you're trying to find operators that coarse grain to multiples of themselves. So that's a bit, you know, like a, a discrete cartoon version of a, a primary field in a CFT. And then, you know, the eigenvalue would correspond maybe to, uh, to the conformal dimension or the, the two to the minus the conformal dimension uh, and so on and so forth. So one can try to extract, you know, also, OP, and, you know, one can do, try to do the same with OPP coefficients and so on. So there are some heuristics by which one can try to extract and sort of this has been sort of numerically validated and there's a few explicit constructions, also things I've worked on um, uh, where one can really, uh, show that you know, certain simple CFTs uh, can be described in this way or can be approximated in this way. Okay. I mean, I think there's lots to be done. We don't really understand this yet very well, um, but maybe that's all I want to say. So there's, an, there's another ansatz than matrix products says for one-dimensional systems. It comes with this uh, self similar hierarchical scale invariant structure, and it appears to be you know, uh, uh, sort of conceptually suited to describing critical states in one dimension. Right. And, um, so that's okay. That's maybe ends sort of my the part of you know my lectures that sort of tensor network generalities for you know sort of things that uh, and, and now I want to move a bit to make contact with pathology and ADCFT and so on. Um, and I mean, I guess we already see one uh, something that looks a bit holographic here in this picture, right? Because we have a two dimensional network that describes a one dimensional state. And I was already talking about CFTs and so on. This is, I mean, drawing connections there. So I guess that's something that, that uh, um, uh, Brian observed, Brian who's, uh, Schwingel was also giving lectures uh, this week, uh, a while back. And, and he sort of suggests that, that maybe, maybe somehow there should be a correspondence between well, ADCFT holography and you know, this mirror. So kind of maybe mirror is kind of like, the, can be somehow identified with, you know, say a time slice in the bulk of some, uh, you know, in, in say two plus one dimensional ADS. Uh, and, you know, I mean, depending on your tastes, you could feel that maybe there is something uh, hyperbolic in the way I've been drawing these lines, right? If you sort of zoom out, maybe that kind of looks like, you know, a minimal surface and, uh, and some hyperbolic geometry. Uh, other people think of it in a different way. So this has been a bit of a debate some years ago, like how to really interpret this network. But at least I think the general feature is there's a two dimensional description. You can play games such as you could like cut open your network here, insert an operator that's localized in this bulk, in this right virtual bulk kind of. And that would have a, a somewhat non-local effect on the boundary, right? And you know, maybe it would create uh, some mode that's pretty delocalized here. So in some sense, there's even kind of a mapping between bulk and boundary that you could define in this way. And this sort of vague idea, I want to basically take and explore more, uh, uh, well, in, in a very idealized situation where there's no geometry for the rest of the day. And then tomorrow in a setting where we actually come back to tensor networks and we actually want to build sort of toy models um, of some uh, some of these, you know, more information theoretically paradigmatic features of uh, of ADCFT, also what Netta um, uh, spoke about. Okay, so that's um, sort of the whirlwind uh, conclusion of, of tensor networks. So we briefly spoke about these two other families, um, uh, uh, Peps and Mera in particular. Um, so I think now I wanna sort of uh, switch gears a little bit. We can forget tensor networks for a moment. They will come back uh, hopefully at the end of today or if not uh, beginning of tomorrow. Um, and sort of uh, maybe discuss a bit what's sort of interesting maybe to me as a confirmation theorist about, about you know, what I understand of, of holography, uh, maybe collect some confusions. Maybe these confusions have already been resolved in past lectures uh, this week. That would be both unfortunate, but also you know, make for a nice conversation. Um, and then we wanna uh, uh, look at a particular toy model called the three Qtrit code and understand how that resolves those puzzles. Uh, so I hope that, that Netta did not talk about the three Qtrit code yesterday. Um, okay, I don't see violent uh, 
uh, reactions. Okay. Okay. So now I'm I'm going to start writing stuff. Um, for good. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, want to motivate some extremely simple model of one aspect of AD50. Okay. And before doing that, uh, let's actually collect the kind of features that we want to reproduce in such a model, right? Of course, we don't want to study the real deal because that would be complicated, and we want to rather focus on some on some phenomena and try to understand those and you know or reproduce those in as as, as simple as possible. Okay. So, what are some of the mysteries to me about ADCFT? Or maybe not only to me, but actually what you know has puzzled people in the past and what has you know led to some of these developments that we'll be discussing. Um, so one thing uh, is, and, and basically the the confusion comes by you know taking uh, some of the uh, entries of the dictionary that we know sort of very literally. And then there seem to be some, you know, apparent puzzles or, or confusions or paradoxes. And then we have to think about, you know, why, why are they not problems? Uh, no problems uh, at all if, if we think about them in a more nuanced way. Okay. So one um, thing that could be confusing is in some sense, um, uh, the extrapolate dictionary. Okay. So that's, uh, so that's the idea, right? That if you you can uh, say for the purpose of computing correlation functions, you can think of a so okay. So in ADSVT, right? There's this mapping mapping between boundary uh, fields and certain bulk fields, and then if you want to compute some boundary correlation function, you can compute correspondingly a bulk correlation functions where you take the operators all the way to the boundary. Okay, so somehow, if uh, say in, in two plus one dimensions, maybe this is my time slice of ADS two, um, then maybe I care about some operator. I don't know. Maybe I call this O of capital X. Capital X is always boundary coordinates. Uh, little axis bulk coordinates. Um, so maybe I take the corresponding uh, dual bulk field and I sort of let this one you know, go all the way out. So I take the radial coordinate, say go to infinity here. So right then somehow we heuristically we would say, um, dictionary, the entry in the dictionary corresponding to this, uh, would kind of say that uh, you know some suitable rescaling Say radial coordinate to the to, to the conformal dimension of this bulk field. So it has say some capital X coordinate. That's maybe this uh, coordinate on the circle and a radial coordinate um, would convert in some vague sense to the to a corresponding boundary operator. So for the purpose of computing correlation functions, for example. Okay. Um, now uh, that's okay. So what would that mean? So in particularly, so so now we can look at the following situation. We can take the same bound and the same bulk field, but at a different point. Let's maybe say this is my favorite point. This is phi of y. Okay. So now because phi of y and phi of x commute, um, it means that phi of y and O of capital X would also commute. Okay. So it would mean that this boundary operator being a limit um, of you know certain bulk operators, and each of these bulk operators commutes with, with the one I fixed here over there. Um, we would somehow conclude that these two operators commute, okay? And that's weird, right? Because somehow we would, ex I guess, expect that these local operators, they kind of build up the whole algebra on the boundary and similarly in the bulk. And so somehow now everything commutes, okay? And that should not be the case, right? Because somehow this should be duality. So everything in the bulk should have an equivalent boundary representation. So in particular, we can have like a conjugate pair of operators that should not commute. So that would be very weird, okay? Um, so that seems to be very weird if, if indeed this would be somehow true as an equation. Of course, it's somehow, I mean, it's like a, some, someone, you know, a problematic thing to even write this down, what I'm writing down here, because maybe they even live on different Hilbert spaces that we have to identify first and so on. But maybe let's just record this as something that maybe at least warrants some discussion. Okay. So let's maybe call this not a problem, but at least a, a puzzle that maybe one can uh, think about. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll. Uh, question. Yep, yep. Uh, usually, at least the way I understand the dictionaries between the fields and the source is not the fields equating operators. So wouldn't that just be this? I, I like, can you even think about the, the fact that the fields would commute because they're classical and translate that to operators, given that the fields actually give are equal to the sources and not to the operators in the QFT? Um. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I'm thinking of of you. You you have your semi-class description. There's some 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 Q of T on the bulk. So there's some bunch of operators, you, and, and somehow there, there 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 should be a way, right, of computing these correlation functions. Well, sorry, there's that, and then there's a bunch of operators on the boundary, and you you want to compute correlation function on on one side, 
And the, I guess the claim is that you can do this in terms of bulk uh, of correlation functions as you take the operators all the way to infinity. I guess that's that's my understanding, right? And that, that sort of, I mean, on a heuristic level seems to lead to this problem. Um, I'm not sure, maybe it's, maybe someone can, uh, maybe I'm not using the right language. Uh, maybe someone wants to jump in, but that's sort of my, uh, uh, my take on this. Yeah. Maybe Tom, you wanna. Um, I mean, the extrapolate dictionary is a statement about operators mapping to operators. So mm. yeah, I mean, it's a, it's just a different way of thinking about it rather than sources. Yeah. Okay. It's a it's a quantum state. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I also have a question. Um, so I guess in these like tensor model or tensor network toy models, like we can't actually take R to infinity, right? Because like, I guess the number of like uh, layers of unitaries you have is still like discrete. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, is that okay? Or do we like interpret that as some kind of cutoff or? Um, let's maybe not worry about this for now, because I mean, it's true that somehow, um, I mean, for this statement that I guess there was some limit and R had to go to infinity, but say for this paradox, now there's no R in this anymore, right? There's just an object that lives on the boundary. There's an object that lives on the bulk. They are like as localized as can be, right? They're like, like local operators. And they commute, right? And that makes would also make sense in a tensor network, right? Where maybe this boundary part of, on, and a bulk part. So we'll come back to that in, in more precision. And I think it will become clear from the kind of example or toy model I'll, I'll, I'll discuss. But in principle, right? Somehow this thing did not, oh, sorry. Uh, this statement did not refer to a radial coordinate anymore. It was just, you know, a one definite point in the bulk, oh, sorry, one definite local, localized degree freedom in the bulk and one definite localized degree freedom on the boundary. Uh, I mean, it's a good question to ask, you know, can one somehow build continuous models, uh, maybe even using tensor networks or what about approximation, but I think we don't have to worry about this at this point, at, the, at this level. Thank you. Okay, the, the next uh, sort of thing that's not a puzzle, but that's, uh, well, pretty cool from a confirmation point of view is actually Ryu Takanagi formula, um, because it's, it's pretty weird, right, in some sense, well, um, that somehow a, an entropy somehow sees into a geometric structure, one could think. Okay. And um, I'll sort of, uh, sorry, let me just write this down. You, oh, let me just write RT formula. Um, right, so that would say that the entropy is, um, let's say in leading order, uh, the area of some minimal surface. So maybe I'm again going to draw this picture in a bit of a nicer way. Okay, not that round. Let's say we have subsystem A here on the boundary. Whoop. Okay, I think um, artistic skills are failing me today. Um, right, and then there's some minimal surface here. Um, 40 Newton. And so that's kind of, uh, right, that's sort of the, the first. So the original version of the real form in a static situation. I'll, on, I'll only talk about static situations today. Um, and then, okay, there's also a, a correction to this proceed to, to this uh, to this formula, right? Because uh, you know the state uh, of your bulk fields could also be entangled, right? And so the next there's the, there's a, there's another term in this formula if one does it more precisely, which is actually the entropy um, of the bulk fields, but not on the entire bulk, which is, you know might well be in a pure state, but um, the entropy of those fields restricted to this region here, okay which is basically what's, what's called the entanglement wedge. I guess the entanglement wedge is a, is a, is a higher dimensional object, but this is a, it's intersection with a time slice. So let's maybe call this guy, uh, this region little a. Um, so this region is little a. Uh, well, actually let me maybe uh, leave this one blue because uh, I, I already drew this in blue and then maybe this one becomes red, this curve here. And then we're going to minimize, and I guess the more modern way is to minimize this joint expression rather than um, uh, first the area and then look at the corresponding state on the on on this on this entanglement wedge, so-called entanglement wedge. Um, so so what I wrote down, right? That's sort of an, another entry in the dictionary, if you wish, uh, sort of a very information theoretic one. And it's kind of it's kind of tantalizing, right? It sort of suggests that somehow this part of the boundary. Is, is kind of sensitive to everything up to this RT surface, sensitive to the information in the entanglement wedge and maybe not to anything else, right? It seems like so for this subsystem, the, the RT surface um, 
is kind of like yeah, a horizon of some sort. Like you can go up to there, but no further. Okay. So that's the RT surface, that's the entanglement wedge. And I think some of uh, Mukun discussed RT and, 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 and Aneta, I think, also mentioned this, right? So I, I think that's probably something you, you've all discussed. Now, um, this intuition, right, um, sort of suggests that, you know, um, or if one combines this, this intuition or this idea uh, with the fact that somehow everything in the bulk should also have a corresponding boundary realization or dual, then um, one uh, could conjecture and people conjecture it that it's maybe true that any bulk operator localized in this region would have a corresponding boundary representative that's only supported on subsystem A, okay? I mean, right now we're just like computing entropy. It seems like the entropy inside of this, of this part of the bulk seems to be correlated with the entropy of that boundary, right? That's the statement of this formula, but sort of, you know, maybe one way to explain this would be by postulating that actually the, all the quantum information in this region is sort of in, uh, is, 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 uh, can be recovered from quantum or is, 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 is um, contained in the quantum information of that boundary subregion. Okay, and if one writes this in the Heisenberg picture, um, then one arrives at the following statement that, that is called subregion duality. And which would say that uh, the, the claim or the statement that we can write any uh, bulk operator in this entanglement wedge of A, so that was little a, um, as a boundary operator, an operator on the boundary Hilbert space um, that's supported in A only. Okay, so A is my boundary subsystem and little a is the corresponding entanglement wedge. Okay, so this has been you know, proved to theoretical physics standards um, uh, uh, using quantum information tools by, by, by Shidong, Dan Arlo and Aaron Wall. Um, we also contributed a little bit some, uh, some more detailed analysis, which was about, you know, what if the, all these formulas only hold approximately, but that's not so interesting today. So some of we believe this to be true, um, but it's still um, in some sense an open problem to actually, um, right? So, so that really means in a very concrete way, right? That any local operator sitting here has, it, has some, should have some expression on the boundary. And now the question is like, what does the, you know, can you write down a formula for this? And in some situations we know how to write down a formula, but in others we don't. So there's, you know, for, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we don't have to go into us. I, I drew some pictures in my notes, uh, but in general, sort of maybe that's an open question, but not one for, uh, for us. Um, explicit formulas, for, formulas are only uh, known in special cases. And so maybe Neda spoke about uh, the causal wedge as opposed to the entanglement wedge and the HKLL prescription and these kind of things, or maybe she, she still will, but that, that's sort of what's related to, to this uh, question only known in special cases. Okay. Um, so let's, but let's just roll with this and try to uh, arrive at another puzzle or confusion. Um, and let's again, look at, you know, time size of ADS2, maybe now using a circle. And let's try partition the boundary into three pieces. A, B, and C, and they together cover the whole boundary. Okay. Um, so that so and let us focus on a an operator sitting sort of say in, in the center here, Oop, in the center of the ball. Okay, that's I don't know five zero or something. That's some particular operator. Maybe I'll not write the zero here. Okay. So right, the extrapolate dictionary told us what happens with bulk operators as we go all the way to infinity. But now we are we are playing a different game. We are fixing a bulk operator sitting at some site. And we want to write this local bulk operator in some non-local way, but not completely non-local. It should be supported on the on an, the entanglement. Uh, it should be supported on a region whose entanglement wedge contains this point. Okay. And now, if I looked at say a single um, say boundary piece of the regions I chose, say for example, suppose I look at C. Well, the minimal surface looks like this, so the entanglement wedge is this one. So it does not contain this point. Okay. So that means I should not expect that I can write. I can, I can find a boundary operator that has the same action of this bulk operator sitting at the center. But if I take two regions together, then of course that works, right? For example, if I look at A and B together, then the entanglement wedge of A and B, well, that's just a complement. That's just where everything, the RT surface for A and B is the same as the RT surface for C, right? It's the same curve. So the entanglement wedge for AB is everything in here. So if we believe subregion duality, and we should because it kind of has been proved, 
then we would believe maybe that we can write this operator phi as some CHT operator that's only supported in regions, subregions A and B of the boundary, not on the whole boundary. Okay. And again, that's because uh, the entanglement, well, the RT surface for AB is this one. Um, and the entanglement wedge, therefore, is this region. And um, we believe that any bulk operating entanglement wedge can be written as a corresponding boundary operator. Okay. Now, of course, the picture I drew is, is symmetrical, right? So I can uh, just as well pick A and C or B and C. Right? And the same reasoning applies. So the entanglement wedge, the RT surface, say, for AC uh, is this one. Oop. And the RT surface for um, BC is that one. So everything in this orange region here uh, is inside the entanglement wedges of you know, both AB and AC and, and BC, which means that if we believe some region duality, then we should be able to write the same operator phi as either OAB or OAC, uh, well, for some other O, operator O, or OBC, right? So there should be three equivalent ways, three ways of writing this operator, uh, at the same bulk operator phi as, as boundary operators, but this one is only supported in AB, that one is only supported in AC, and that one's only supported in BC. And that seems is another puzzle, right? That's another problem because if I have an operator and well, I know it's not supported on C, but it's also not supported on B, it's not supported on A, it's supported nowhere, right? That's the identity operator. Okay. Um, so it seems like every operator, every bulk operator sitting inside this triangle, um, the, the, the hyperbolic triangle is, is, is trivial. Okay, but that's of course not, that should not be the case. Okay, so that's maybe another puzzle. Great, so now we have two puzzles. We have this uh, one word, things commuting. Um, and we have this one that somehow uh, would say that, uh, well, these operators, they somehow should be the same, but their support in the end happens to be disjoint. Well, our sort of support is A, B intersected, A, C intersected, B, C. So they are nowhere supported. So is that the zero operator? That seems weird. Okay. So I think we have now collected enough problems that we can try to find sort of a, um, well, think about an explanation. Um, let me just check chat. Ah, okay, great. So you're discussing the, yep, very good. Um, yeah, so so does anyone have a thought as to what's, uh, you know, how could one salvage this picture? Um, what could be, uh, you know, it, it really seems like, you know, if these operator inequalities, they should not be true. Uh, at the same time, we kind of derive them from plausible arguments, perhaps. Okay. So kind of the, the, the way I guess we, we now think about this is, uh, well, unless someone wants to propose an answer. So the idea is, um, I guess my, maybe one way of saying it is that somehow it's not the case that the entire CFT Hilbert space corresponds to, you know, one particular, you know, semi-classical bulk description, right? For example, I guess maybe you discussed in some other lectures that, you know, maybe for a, a generic state, somehow there's no nice semi-classical bulk, there's some, just maybe some gigantic black hole somewhere, or maybe there's like some kind of very quantum space time or whatever. So actually, only a few states, relatively few states of your CFT would correspond to any particular sort of bulk picture or description, okay? In other words, we should think of these statements, sorry, state of statements like this one and that one, not as statements that should, that should hold on the entire CFT of that space, but only on a subspace of states. So this subspace is, I mean, these choice of subspace, they're nowadays called code subspaces because somehow the whole thing is a bit related to error correction, as we'll uh, explore in a moment. But that's kind of the idea. So somehow the idea is that um, if these things really hold as operators on the same big CFT Hilbert space, HA tensor HB tensor HC, then there's a problem. But there's no problem at all if we only demand this to hold for a few states, for states on some subspace. Okay, so that's uh, the proposed resolution. Okay. Resolution. Um, well, let me maybe say only you know a few whatever few means, and that's an interesting question, uh, but not for today. Uh, CFT states um, or subspace, maybe maybe only a small subspace, um, uh, should correspond to say, you know, any any given um, semi-classical bulk description. Right, so if you radically change your bulk, you couldn't even compare these operators, right? So an operator at some point wouldn't even make sense in, in, in sort of 
colloquially speaking. So, oops, sorry. So in other words, yeah, as I was saying, we should sort of think of statements like, you know, this commutator vanishing, O of X, phi of Y, um, to only hold on a subspace, on a so-called code subspace of the CFT Hilbert space. Okay. And okay, it's codes, it's called code subspace because then all the features we discussed here, they have in relation to quantum error correction. It's not yet so clear, okay. And so this idea that quantum error correction should play a role, I guess it goes back to ideas of, of the Valinda brothers and then Almiri, Dong and Harlow, I think they identified this very clearly uh, in this context um, and, and proposed that error correction ha has, has something to say for all these various paradoxes, okay. And so kind of what my plan was for, for this and next lecture, and we'll see how far things will be getting, is to basically explore toy models that really faithfully reproduce these three features. Um, but somehow everything's nice, finite dimensional, exactly solvable in a sense, and it's very easy to understand the mechanism. Uh, so then we can sort of once and for all sort of, you know, be happy that there's no paradox in principle and, you know, better now that's some of the cartoon of I'm presenting, you know, how faithful it is now to ADCHT is of course a different question, but sort of there's no paradox in principle. Okay. So that's kind of, um, I guess now we listed some features that we would like to see. We would like to sort of see that this is not a problem. You would see that something like the real Takanagi formula can emerge from very simple principles, from very simple general principles. Uh, and that subregion duality is also not no issue that we can have such an equality, but on a subspace states. Okay. So the remaining 20 minutes, I want to discuss um, the so-called three q trait codes, which is like a completely, you know, idealized toy model of such a mapping where one maps one bulk degree freedom. So there's no geometry in the bulk, there's just one degree freedom, kind of like this one sitting here into a boundary, but just, just composed out of three degrees of freedom. And, uh, but nevertheless, we'll see that in this toy model, all these features are basically hold. And the only one that's a bit tenuous is maybe the real Takanagi formula because there's not really so many surfaces to play around with if you just have a single site in the bulk. Okay, so we have to worry about this separately and we'll worry about this using tensor networks. Okay, so that's the plan. So let's talk about this uh, three q trit q trit code. So it turns out that somehow qubits won't work in the, you know, for the kind of, uh, in, in, the, in this case, just because there's somehow the objects I wanna write down don't exist. So we, we are going to use qtrits, but that's okay. So qtrits is a three level system, okay? So what do I wanna do? I wanna somehow take this situation and, and so and sort of idealize it. So what's going on here? I have one bulk degree of freedom. Let's take this to be a qtrit just for fun. And, and this bulk degree of freedom has some equivalent representation in the boundary. And let's suppose A is just a single Q-trit, that's a single Q-trit, that's a single Q-trit. So I wanna build a mapping that maps one Q-trit into three Q-trits. Okay, so and, and I, I guess I'm going to use my sort of tensor pictures, but really just sort of to indicate input and then write this three outputs, three legs. That's the A leg, B and C. I guess B and C like so. Um, so kind of uh, this one is, if you want your, I don't know, my bulk input. And that's the, oh, sorry. These are the outputs. So this is just a, a, a by the picture and our usual graphical notation for a linear map, tensor, four tensor, a linear map from one QT to three QT. Okay, so that's a map from uh, C3 to C3 tensor. C3, tensor C3. And I wanna build such a map in such a way that you know all these properties above, all the puzzles are kind of well reproduced so that they are not, not no puzzles anymore. So how is this map defined? Well, I'm going to define it on basis states and then we just extend by linearity. So there's three basis states, right, for our qubits. Let's call them uh, uh, ket I. Uh, oh yeah, I guess I should have used orange. So this is orange. Um, I also want an abbreviation for the corresponding output. I'm going to call this one I tilde, and I'm going to define it now. So I tilde, so I is a state of a single Q trit. I tilde is a state of these three Q trits, A, B, and C. And the definition of cat I tilde is an equal superposition of three states. And they look kind of funny. This is sum over J, and then we have J, 
um, I think uh, J plus I and J minus I. Okay, and all the arithmetic is modular too. So minus I is the same as adding twice I, mod three. Sorry, modular modulo three, not modular two, modular three, because I'm doing Q treads. Okay. okay, so this I that we have got this basis state I that the same label I enters here, but I'm summing over a complete Q basis of my Q treads here, right? So J, just to be very explicit, J runs from zero to two here. And these things right there, and we see now that these are now states of three Q tricks. So again, superposition of um, J, uh, tensor J plus I, tensor J minus I as J ranges from zero to two. Okay. So this is just a linear map that I can define. And it's sort of easy to see that it's an isometry that is it maps orthogonal states to orthogonal states. Indeed, um, these, st these states I tilde are orthogonal for different choices of I. So that defines a good map from one Q to three Q traits. Yeah. All right. So this is in sort of, you know, in, in sort of error correction, error correction language, we are encoding a three-dimensional three system, a three-level system, three dimensions uh, into three times three times three, 27 dimensions. Okay. So that, you know, is vaguely similar to maybe how for any given bulk, right? If I, if you look at different states of your, of your favorite bulk field, that gives rise to some subspace of the Steve Tierbert space, but Steve Tierbert space is much, much larger. So this much, much larger Steve Tierbert space corresponds to my 27 dimensional space. And, you know, there's three states and that 27 dimensional states, and they're defined like so. And they sort of correspond to different states of, you know, my favorite, you know, site in the bulk, which is the, the one that, you know, is this one. Okay. All right, so now whenever I have, I have such a map, I can you know, take a state of my bulk q trit and I can define a state on the boundary q trit. I mean, here, that's the, the, the map says how we do it for basis states. Now by linearity, we can extend this to arbitrary pure states. And if I had a mixed state, well, I would just send this mixed state rho to v rho v dagger. So whenever I have a, such, a, such a mapping, um, I can uh, take a state rho. Um, and it will be encoded, which just means uh, we can define a corresponding uh, state in this 27 dimensional bed space. Let's call this one row tilde, and it lists on ABC, and it's just V row V dagger. Okay. So I'm just thinking of the three of these, of the single Q trait as a subspace of the 27 dimensional space by virtue of this map B. Likewise, I can take an operator. Uh, sorry, let's say phi, I guess is the language we use. Um, and this operator, I can similarly build a corresponding boundary operator. Uh, maybe this one, uh, confusingly, I will call phi tilde um, because we also define O's later on, but that's really a thing that lives on the boundary of that space. So it's a bit confusing. So tilde is always boundary things, no tilde is bulk things. And well, how do I define it? I just do the same with this operator, okay. So now if I define things in this way, it's of course true that if I compute say an expectation value of this uh, bulk operator in this bulk state row, that's the same as computing the expectation value of this operator phi tilde in boundary state rho tilde. Okay, and that's just because, uh, well, by sort of because V is an isometry, it holds that um, V dagger V equals identity. Right? So if I multiply, say, these two things, but right, to compute an expectation value, I would multiply phi tilde with rho tilde, then this V V dagger cancels, V dagger V cancels. And then if I take the trace, to compute the expectation value, the other VV daggers also cancel. They always are in this in this in this order. Isometry. Okay. Isom the fact that V is an isometry, of course, means that this is actually a state that has traced one. Okay, so now um, so far, not there was nothing special about you know having three legs here. There was nothing, you know, that's uh, I mean, we could just have taken arbitrary isometry. Okay, so now comes something that's very special about this code, okay. And it's basically a way of writing this isometry, this encoding map B in a way that uh, is somewhat, it it, yeah, it, it's sort of, an, yeah, it's just an interesting rewriting of this map, okay. And then we'll explore, it, it has sort of very interesting consequences. So the key fact is the following. I'm taking the same formula as above, um, but I wanna build this state, this corresponding state in a slightly different way, okay. And the way I want to write it is as follows. Um, I first want to take a, so we, we kind of see that there's a sum from J to zero to two over kind of there's J, you know, and J appears a couple of times. 
So that vaguely looks like an entangled state, right? And, wh and what I want to do is I want to try to build this state by actually taking a maximum entangled state together with this i and then entangling them, right? So a maximum entangled state of two qtrids and next to that maximum entangled state, I take cat i and then I want to sort of uh, mix them together by another unitary. So I think it's easy if I just write down the formula. So I want to take a maximum entangled state, I guess these are often called phi plus, maximum entangled state of the first two boundary qtrids. And I'm going to add just a basis state, cat i, same one as here. So this is a state. And um, okay, well, maybe I should say what phi plus is. So phi plus AB is one over square root of three, sum over J, J, J. Just an ordinary maximum entangled state of two qtrids. So this is now a state of three qtrids. So somehow I wanna now go from this state to that state, okay? So how could I do this? How could I do this? Um, I claim I can do this without ever looking at subsystem. Right, because subsystem A should anyways be in this general state J. So what I really have to achieve is I have to somehow map J and I to J plus I, J minus I. So thus I can do only by looking at the last two indices. So the second step in this preparation process is I do nothing with A, um, but I apply a unitary on BC. And this unitary, oops, this unitary is such that it maps well, we can just read off what it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to map a basis state Ji to J plus I, J minus I. So that's my definition, okay. And now you can see, right, somehow this state is a big sum over J, 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 I. Right, so J, J, I. And now if I apply this unitary in BC, this J, I part will get, get exactly replaced by what's written here. So my claim is, this is another way of creating the same, encoding the same base, the state and space state as before. Okay, I'll, I'll draw maybe a picture while you, while you think about uh, whether you agree. So the picture is that this isometry V, and now maybe it's going to be useful to write the outputs all at the bottom. So that's the A, the B and the C output. I can uh, write in a different way. I can take a max entangled state. That one usually draws like this. Maybe Patrick also did so. Um, and one takes just this input here, and now we apply a unitary on this side. And that's really what the same what this formula is saying. Okay, right? Because this formula was true for any basis state cat i, so it's true for an arbitrary state. So I can just not fix the state, and I can just compare the maps. Are there any questions about this rewriting? It's unitary. It's just one. Um, yep, and this maximum entangled state is this one sitting here. All right, so um, what's the point? Um, um, maybe uh, just as an exercise, we could ask, we could maybe ask the following question. Um, well, maybe, maybe, yeah, actually let me, so, so I claim that now everything follows from this, from this formula. Okay, and by symmetry, we can do the same. We can simulate single, single out maybe uh, B versus AC and C versus AB because everything looks so symmetric. But I'm now just focusing on the split A versus BC. Okay. So I claim that from this uh, nice decomposition, we get all the good consequences that we like. Um, just one moment to see how I'm doing with relative to, yeah, I think maybe we can still um, resolve all the puzzles. Um, so the first thing maybe I want to discuss is actually, well, not this thing with the commutators, but just the Ryu Takanagi formula. Um, I mean, okay, there's a single bulk site here, so okay. Um, uh, but let's just compute entropy, okay, and then we, we can discuss whether we call this an RT formula. So let's say entropy, question mark, does it have something to do with Ryu Takanagi? Um, so my question is, what is the entropy of A? Well, in which state? I want to take an arbitrary state of my bulk system rho, and I'm going to encode it into the boundary. So now I have rho tilde. And my question is, what is the entropy of rho tilde as a function of the entropy of rho? And I want to ask this for subsystem A as well as for subsystem BC. So does anyone have a hunch what the entropy of A 
of the A subsystem B. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an arbitrary density operator and I'm, I'm going to encode it and I'm going to encode it in this way. We apply V and D dagger, okay. Um, equivalently, I can look at the right-hand side picture. I'm going to take an arbitrary density operator here. But in the end, I care about the entropy of this leg. And that's a unitary map. Does anyone have a thought? It's maximally mixed. It's maximally mixed, exactly. Um, do you want to say why or, or um, shall I? I guess because phi plus starts out with it being like maximally entangled and you've only acted with the unitary on BC, so you haven't done anything to A. Exactly, exactly. That's that's perfectly right. Because this is a unitary, unitary, if I act with unitary on one side and then I look the, at the state on the other side, that, that state will never change. And that crucially relies on you being unitary. So we had to kind of, we had to be lucky that this defines a unitary, that uh, this defines a unitary. Exactly. So that's exactly right. So we just have, um, so that's the entropy of a maxi mix state of a single Q-trit. So the entropy is log three. Independently of what the state is. Okay. How about the entropy of VC? Could be worth maybe writing down a formula for the for the reduced state uh, rho tilde BC, um, and you should just shout if you have a if you have a thought. Maybe otherwise. Well, we know it, it has <laughs> to be the same as S of A, given that BC is a complement array. Ah, very good. That would be true if we had a pure state. So mm, if, okay, yes, yes. If rho would be pure, then rho tilde would be pure, and you're exactly right. So we know it. So we know from exactly from what you said that if if rho was a pure state, we would just get the same log three. But if the state is mixed, we there's potential to get a difference. And um, we can sort of proceed similarly as to, to what Annie was saying. I guess we can sort of again look at this picture. We think about okay, there's a state here, and we're well, we're interested in BC. Um, well, but so now the only thing we have to do is we have to trace over A. If and if I trace over A, this max entangled state uh, becomes a maxi mixed state sitting here. So, if, and well, because we're dealing with density operators, we need two copies of this picture to be to make this really precise. So that, that's basically right. There would be the density operator sitting here, then there would be U dagger up here in the same max entangled state, and we would take a partial trace and so on and so forth. And if we did this, we would we would find um, that uh, this boundary state can be exactly written as follows. We take whatever is the state row here. We add, we take what's remaining of this max entangled state, which is a max and mixed state, and then we just apply U, U dagger to it. Okay. And now it's easy to read off the entropy because entropy does not change when I apply unitary. So entropy of rho tilde uh, BC is the same as entropy of this max and mixed state plus the entropy of rho because entropy is additive with, res with respect to tensor products. Okay, so we find that this is the entropy of this max and mixed state log three plus the entropy of the state we started with. So indeed, if rho is pure, we get exactly the same result, but if, if rho is mixed, or in general, um, we add the entropy of this bulk state to log three. Okay. And okay, just by symmetry uh, of this entire construction, the same is going to be true if we look at any other uh, pair of subsystems, and likewise up here, if we look at any single subsystem. So that's kind of cool, right? And um, all right, because it's kind of reflecting what's going on here, right? If I look at the entropy of say A, and the only degree of freedom in the bulk I have is sitting here in the center, well, that's outside the entanglement wedge, right? So the RT formula that we discussed before would just tell me, well, it's, it's the area of this minimal surface here. So it's kind of log three as the area of the minimal surface in our toy model. Okay. Whereas if I look at say B and C together, then the RT surface is sitting here. And according to the RT formula, I should add this area term divided by 4G Newton uh, to the entropy of the bulk state sitting here. That's exactly that correction term here, right? And, and as in this, you know, as in this situation, whenever I look at a single interval, well, uh, uh, one of these elementary subsystems here, the entanglement wedge does not include the site. So there's no correction term, no bulk entropy term. And if I look at any two, the site is included. Okay, so that's really now represented in our toy model. So we can really think of, um, Right, this is kind of the area term in some sense. And um, let's see, I guess this was blue. This is the, I don't know, bulk, bulk contribution. Okay, 
so it's really kind of a, you know a very toy but nevertheless uh, well a model of of what's going on in this in this sort of you know situation we discussed before uh, michael you got five minutes thanks any any thoughts or complaints about so far about about entropy excuse me could you please repeat why where the um, one third of the density times rho comes from one third of the density oh. is the uh, maximally mixed state coming from b right yeah yeah so the maximum exactly so so the idea is i take i take a, a state on abc and what does it look like? Well, it's it's it, I, I, it's a state I get by taking the state row, tensor a max entangled state on AB, and then I trace over A. Well, and I also apply, the, yeah, maybe I'll just write it down, what I said in words. So so this picture kind of tells me the way to write the status, right? I, whoop, I start shoot, I start with row, I add this max to mix state, phi plus, phi plus. Right, that's on AB, that's on C if you want. Now I still have to act, act with the unitary. And because I have a mixed state, I have to do it on both sides, right? I do identity on A, tensor U, B, C. Identity on A, tensor U, B, C dagger. And so this is a formula. Um, sorry, I should add parentheses. So this formula, right? That's the same formula as V rho V dagger. So that's the whole boundary state, rho tilde A, B, C. And now I want to take a partial trace over A. Um, so, well, because there's an identity here, it suffices to take the partial trace over A here and not have the identity. So that leads exactly to this formula. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Great. Okay, so now uh, I think we can uh, quickly talk about um, the other properties, the other mysteries. So one was this idea of subregion duality. So subregion duality told us that if we have a, a bulk site and an operator uh, at the bulk, and you know this site, the, the location of this operator is contained in the entanglement wedge of the on oh no, some boundary region, then we can equivalently write where we can find a boundary operator that's supported only on that boundary region and has the same action. Okay, so as we discussed. Um, if we look at a single subsystem like A, um, then the entangled wedge does not contain the bulk site. So there we should not expect to be able to do so. But if we look at two of the subsystem, boundary subsystems, say BC, then we should be able to write our bulk operator as an, as an operator on BC. Okay. So my question is to, you, to, to you is, can you find, can you define an operator OBC in some way, you know, given a bulk operator phi, so there should be something around, this uh, around this, uh, around phi, in such a way that this operator has the same expectation values in all code states. Okay, so what we want is we want that the expectation value, if I compute, you know, the expectation value of phi, for example, in a bulk state row, that should be the same as the expectation value of OB of this operator OBC after encoding. Right, that's that's what I want. I want sort of if I compute the expectation value in the in the bulk, it's the same as for doing the boundary. And really, I actually only, I don't only want this for a single operator, but also for correlation functions. Okay. So can you, uh, so, it, so just staring at the formulas here, right? So because this operator only is on, on BC, that really we only care about this state over here. So can you cook up a definition of OBC in terms of phi such that this is true? So maybe in the interest of um, time, I'll, I'll sort of say it. Um, so we can basically just, um, well, stare at this formula here, right? So, you know, if we didn't have the unitary around, well, we would just act with phi here and with the identity there. And then, you know, just things would just uh, uh, multiply in the right way. Now we have this U, so kind of we also need U in the definition of O, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take U, B, C, identity on B, tensor this phi operator on C, U, B, C dagger, okay? And now if you compute, say, the expectation value of O, B, C in the state row tilde, Right, then you would take the trace of this operator times that operator. The U dagger U's, they cancel in this trace. So it's just the trace of this operator times that operator. And that's, well, one times the trace of phi times rho, which is this expectation value. Okay, so that's nice. Um, yeah, Tom, I hope you give me uh, my usual five minutes. That's okay. Go ahead, yeah. Thanks. Um, Okay, 
So it means that for any to any bulk operator phi, maybe I'll yeah, to any bulk operator phi, I can associate a corresponding boundary operator um, such that when I for, from perspective of computing these expectation values, there's no difference. So so what this means is that we basically resolve this second puzzle I mentioned, right? Because now we we understand in which sense it should be true that this operator phi is the same as this operator OBC. They're not the same operators, right? Even, uh, but somehow their action on, on these states is the same, right? So, uh, so or in, other, in other words, computing expectation values with, with respect to phi on an arbitrary bulk state is the same as computing expectation values or correlation functions using those operators on not all boundary states, but just the ones that I get by encoding. Right, so only states of this form rho tilde, which are kind of the states that have a good bulk interpretation. Right, if I took an arbitrary state in this twenty-seven dimensional Hilbert space, I could not write it as you know the image of a bulk state under this isometry V under this encoding map V. So there's I only on a three-dimensional subspace is it going to be true that these two operators are the same, and what that really means is that this identity holds. Okay. Um, all right, so that's one aspect of subregion duality. So in some, in this sense, maybe we resolved um, the second puzzle. So the operators are not the same. Maybe it doesn't even make sense to equate them because they act in different spaces. But on this code subspace, they have the same action. And one can sort of sharpen this a little bit. Maybe one can say that it's actually even true that if you say encode your state by this map V, and then you act with the operator BC, that's the same as first acting with a sort of the bulk version of this operator, and then you encode. It's kind of like this intertwining property. So first acting by phi and then going from bulk to boundary is the same as first going from bulk to boundary and then operating, acting with this operator BC. Okay. Okay. Um, we discussed things in the Heisenberg picture here, right? So we discussed again that any operator acting on the bulk here has an equivalent realization say on any two of the boundary subsystems, for example, on BC. So that's kind of a Heisenberg picture way of thinking because we talk about operators. You can also think about this in the Schrodinger picture. So what this means in the Schrodinger picture is that if I take an arbitrary state row and I'm going to encode it in the boundary using this map. So I have the state row tilde ABC, but now I only hand you the reduced state on B and C then you should be able to figure out exactly what the state was that what, what, what the bulk state was that I started with. Okay. And that's because somehow, you know, from knowing BC alone, you're able to compute all expectation values of the state file row. And so it's enough to figure out right, knowing these expectation values is enough to figure out the state itself. So in the Schrodinger picture, if you want, there should be a formula for rho in terms of rho BC tilde only. So not the whole boundary state that will of course be trivial, you just apply B, B dagger. Uh, but just row BC, okay. And that's of course clear also from this formula, right? If you just look at the formula, how can I get this input? Well, I just apply U dagger and then I forget about the first leg. Or if I look at this formula, maybe more formally, I just apply U dagger U. Now I'm left with that state here. And then I just trace over the, the first system. So I just trace over B. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we encoded this single q trit into three q trits in such a way that when you lose any of these q trits, you can still decode what the bulk state was. And that's what we mean by error correction. That's what we mean by quantum error correction. Okay. So, so this is uh, called an erasure code. What we built, so this map V is an erasure code. Um, which means that in this case can decode the bulk state. So we can figure out what the bulk state was, bulk state row from row tilde BC or row tilde AC or row tilde AB alone. So we can lose one q -trit. We can still figure out the quantum information, which by decoupling, which Patrick explained, means that if you only knew one of the q trits of the boundary, you would not learn anything at all, right? That was this duality. So that's kind of the picture. We can think of in terms of operators, we can think of terms of error correction, and that really you know, fully resolves uh, these problems. So we didn't yet talk about the part with the commutators. Maybe that's a nice exercise to think about, and maybe that's the last thing I'm going to say today. Um, so maybe exercise, uh, resolve 
the first puzzle for yourself. And happy to chat about it more tomorrow, or you can look at the at the notes that I'll upload in a moment. Um, it's basically that, right? I mean, again, we would expect that this identity does not hold everywhere, but suitably formulated, it holds only on this code subspace, which is the image of the Q-trade inside the 27 dimensional red space. Okay, sorry for scrolling around all the time. Um, I'll, I'll stabilize the picture and uh, that, that, that's it for today. Yes, thanks. Cycle. Um, okay, some quick questions. Um, I'm gonna ask a question. So let's say if I if I know uh, you know in what dimension I'm working um, uh, by dimension I mean space time dimension, would it be possible to actually um, formulate the whole idea CFT in terms of these codes? Like how many how many qubits, uh, roughly speaking, should one need to actually encode the entire idea? CFT? Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's a very subtle question that maybe has no short answer. So, I mean, I think there's maybe various ways of approaching it. So, you, I mean, of course, you know, in ADCFT, everything's infinite dimension. You, you know, if you regulate before even, you know, comparing this, you know, my finite dimensional Hilbert space setting. Um, I mean, something you could do is you could fix some degrees of freedom you really like, right? So, for example, you could say, uh, like in this picture here, I really say care maybe about one mode of, you know, one one particular field in the bulk. And maybe I only restrict to the you know two levels of that you know of, of that mode. That would be a qubit. And then you could try to say, okay, this qubit will somehow you know by what by subregion duality be encoded in in a way like we discussed here, in some in some in, in some you know robust way because uh, actually by virtue of these of these formulas, uh, it will exactly be true that you know you can well sorry by, by virtue of subregion duality it would be true that you can decode this qubit or qubit or qubit from any two is but not from one. So somehow in this sense you don't have to fine tune dimensions or anything, right? It's a very generic phenomenon. Uh, of course you have like you know an infinite infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces and so on, but you know if you could just focus on some modes of interest and then everything in some sense becomes finite dimensional. Maybe that's one 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 uh, sort of direction in which one could answer your question. Um, of course, some of there's many subtleties about it, right? Generically, if you somehow, you know, act with operators in the bulk, then maybe, you know, at some point the bulk starts changing a little bit due to back reactions on. So that's not at all encoded, you know, that's not at all contained in this model that we're discussing here, right? Here is kind of the space is static and you're just, you know, sort of, you know, like messing with the quantum fields without it having any effect. So that's an aspect where this things are unrealistic. And I think, um, I think it's fair to say maybe some people in the audience agree that maybe this entire idea of a code subspace, how to define it exactly and so on, right? And how to and really worrying about, you know, these kind of uh, these kind of effects maybe is still uh, something we're not always very precise about. Um, but I, but yeah, maybe this gives, gives sort of an attempt at, 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 a, at an answer. Yeah. So it's not like you have to somehow fine tune things in a very specific, I mean, okay. You could of course also ask in a specific geometry or in specific dimensions, how much capacity is there in this code, right? And some of what the what this you know um, story I was telling basically suggests that should basically I mean a lot of this you should be able to read off geometrically, in some sense, right? And then there's kind of it sort of decomposes into a geometric aspect, right? For example, you know uh, how much information I can uh, is sort of encoded in B. Well, it, it depends on the data inside this wedge, so there's a geometric part to it, but of course it also depends on the theory and you know, which what fields you look at and so on and so forth. So, in some sense, it decouples in these two ways, I would say. Right. Hope that uh, helps. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I was actually my internet got cut off for the for the oh, last no. uh, one or two sentences that you said. Can you repeat them again? Uh, the last two sentences. Uh, well, um, I, I I heard everything uh, until uh, up to the the geometric. Uh, ah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I was just saying like that parts of kind of um, you know. So so there's some like error correction story going on, but part of its properties are like purely you know. Yeah. Uh, well, they're determined by the geometry of, say, uh, your bulk, right? Just by virtue of where, do, like, what do the entanglement wedges look like, and so on, right? In, in the same way that you know, uh, entropy is not completely general, but basically it's determined you know, up to leading order by the geometry of the bulk. In the same sense, you know, which which local data can be is encoded where, and you know, so how um, and how much bulk data is encoded in a certain boundary subsystem 
you can kind of read off from the geometry, right? Just from the fact that by virtue of subregion duality, you know that the information about the bulk in a subsystem should be exactly the information here, modular subtleties um, and technicalities. But then of course, you know, it, it all, it of course depends on like which fields you look at and, and so on and so forth and, and all the other technicalities I mentioned before. But I think sort of from, from a high level point of view, um, yeah, yeah, no, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe I should not say anything more. I think these are like two, maybe two aspects of maybe addressing your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this was from the very beginning. I probably just missed this, but when we were talking about PEPs um, and like this mm -hmm. open question of like finding which, uh, whether there's like actually a PEPs approximation, I think you said something about like non-unitarity being an obstacle. Uh, could you say more oh. about that? Oh yeah, sorry. I, I was uh, I was sort of talking maybe about two disjoint things there. So one is sort of the this question of approximation. So that's just like you know, can you, as you were saying, for, for a gap local uh, Hamiltonian two D, uh, can you um, is there a, a good uh, and, and compact PEPs approximation of its non state? So that's sort of you know, somewhat an existence question if you want. Uh, you could also ask a different question: If I hand you a PEPs, whether I describe the ground state or not, can you actually compute with it efficiently? So can you compute correlation functions, expectation values efficiently given a PEPs? Uh, and, and we discussed for matrix product states, right? We could do that very, like even for very large systems, somewhere there was no problem because we could sort of do the contraction from left to right. And then, you know, the dimensionality never increased. For a PEPs, that's not possible. There's no kind of smart contraction strategy in general that sort of, you know, keeps kind of the, the Hilbert space dimension bounded independent of the system size in some sense. So for example, one way, and, and so that's kind of more about, you know, how, um, uh, well, at least that at least in principle, right? There could be like a, a simple PEPs that you write down with like constant bond dimensions and so on. And it might be very hard for you as a computer <laughs> to decide actually, even if this is a non-zero quantum state or not. So that's kind of, in some sense, decoupled from the question of, can you, is there a description? It's more like, is the description computation useful? Um, okay, yeah. thank you, yeah. And you know it's kind of uh, it's kind of boring in some sense. It's somehow answering questions about circuits is, is usually hard. For example, you know, or about formulas. You know, is there a satisfying formula? This is like this famous satisfiability problem that's NP hard. That's also true for circuits. You know, is is there sort of a a, a way of you know uh, you have say you have a circuit of Boolean variables and you want to ask you know is there a way of like choosing the inputs in such a way that the output is one or something like that? You can basically encode that directly into a PEPs. Uh, in such a way that the PEPs is you know non-zero if and only if the the formula is satisfiable, and so it's it's one of these computer science things which kind of says, which are, you know, it's very deep. It says there's no efficient algorithm in general, but then of course in practice one can still hope that things work well, and you know people do numerics with these things, and you know it's it's not as fast in one D, but you know there's lots of tricks. Like I mean, one trick is kind of you can uh, do this contraction. You can again try to do it you know from here sort of sideways, but now um, uh, well. Similarly, as we discussed for the thermal state, maybe I, actually let me start at the bottom to the top. Uh, for the thermal state, right, I was kind of saying you you add layer by layer of this, uh, you know, uh, e to the minus epsilon h sort of you know sort of infinitesimal thermal operator, and then I truncate down to an MPS again of like some const, some fixed bond dimension. You could try to do similar things here. So that's kind of maybe I think things that people do in practice, um, or you can use some heuristics to kind of try to I don't know compute and Kind of effective environment of your system and so on and so forth. I, I can I can also send some links about this if, you, if you're interested. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, maybe we can we can um, uh, stop the recording there, and um, if Michael has time to hang out, I guess we can.